I ask you at this time to turn in your Bibles or your worship bulletins to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. Last week we came to the beginning of our reality. We said not God's reality because God has always been. We simply say God is, right? We just say God is. As recorded by Moses under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit... And what we come to in the first chapter of Genesis chapter 1 is simply the first four words, that of in the beginning, God. We stated God is the subject of creation. In some 31 verses, Elohim, the name, the Hebrew name that is given for God here, is mentioned some 35 times. Some 35 times. And we notice something was happening as the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit was hovering over the face of the deep. And now as we continue on in the creation narrative, we'll notice that God is about to speak. Genesis chapter 1, beginning at verse 3. This is God's word. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. Then God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Thus God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. So the evening and the morning were the second day. Then God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth and the gathering together of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the earth bring forth grass and herb that yields seed and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, the herb that yields seed according to its kind, and the tree that yields fruit, whose seed is in itself according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning were the third day. Then God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years, and let them be for the lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth, and it was so. Then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. God set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light to the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning were the fourth day. Then God said, let the waters abound with an abundance of living creatures and let the birds fly above the earth across the face of the firmament of the heavens. So God created great sea creatures and every living thing that moves with which the waters abounded according to their kind and every winged bird according to its kind and God saw that it was good. And God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let the birds multiply on the earth. So the evening and the morning were the fifth day. All men are like grass and all their glories are like the flowers of the field, the grass withers. The flowers fade, but the word of our Lord stands forever. Let's pray. Father, we again come to you as a people in need of your illumination through your spirit, that you would apply these words, your words, to our lives this day, and that it would bring you glory. We ask this all now in Jesus' name. Amen. We come this morning to the further unfolding of Genesis chapter 1, the beginning of all the reality that we know in the creation of all things. For in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, as we learned just in Genesis 1 and verse 1. And as we start out this morning, I'm going to lay out generally the first five days, as I'm not going to go specifically this morning verse by verse by verse in great detail, as I'm going to be drawing more greater themes out of the first five days of things that are repeated and that we should note this morning and then drawing applications from those themes. Please also remember how I view this and how I argue for creation, for that matter, a literal young creation, six 24-hour days. 
with the presupposition that God created all things. I look at it that way. And I defended it, as I said last week. Here's the rough outline of what God made in the first five days as we get started this morning. Day one, God created light. We would say that here is the creation of space and time and matter, light and darkness. This one gets a little difficult as we notice that light is created, but the sun and the moon and the stars are not created until later on in day four. Just what is this light that is created? It's a good question, given the sun was not created yet. Well, I think the best understanding is that light came from God. Some of the older rabbis call it uh, the effulgent splendor of the divine glory, is what it said. Light coming from God's presence, and we know that light can emanate from other things than the sun, because if you go to Revelation 22 and verse 5, speaking of the new heavens and the new earth, the sun is done away with, and where does the light come from? It comes from God. God will be the light. So here we see it the first day. Day two, God separated the sea from the atmosphere, so the clouds and such from the seas, ordering that which over the face of the waters. Well, how do I look at this? The firmament, right? The, two, the big word firmament. Well, when you go look at the sunset in Lake Erie, what do you see? You see the lake and you see the sky and you see the delineation between the two, right? There's lake, then there's sky. Firmament below, firmament above. God ordered that. Day three, God created the land, the earth, the vegetation according to its kind. Day four, God created the sun, the moon, and the stars. Day five, God created the birds of the air according to their kind and marine animals according to their kind. If you desire more information on greater details, I can point you in the right direction. Remember I said Answers in Genesis is a good resource. Institutes for Creation's Research is a good resource. In fact, I purchased this simple little pamphlet. It's called Creation Q&A. It's in the back if you have questions. So simply, let's say you have a question about uh, what about carbon-14 dating, if you know anything about that. Uh, what about tree rings in buried forests? Uh, do mutations cause evolution? Has the Big Bang been proven? This is a great resource. Uh, for you to find, and you have lots of those questions. I'm not going to get into every single little one as we continue to work through this. It's, on, uh, it's in the back there if you would like to take one. This very general outline of the first five days helps us frame the three points for the sermon this morning. The three points are as follows. God speaks, God orders, and God says it's good. God speaks, God orders, and God says it's good. Last week, we took note of the very fact that God is the subject of creation. You can't read Genesis chapter 1 without noticing that it is God, and God is all over his creation. He's the subject. Everything else is an object. The subject works upon the object. And then right away, we come to how God chooses to act. Look at the start of verse 3 with me. Then God said. He acts by simply yet profoundly speaking. Then God said. In verse 6, God speaks and the waters separate. In verse 7, God speaks again and orders the waters. In verse 11, God speaks again. In verse 14, God speaks again. In verse 20, God speaks again. And next week, God will speak again. Well, what does that tell us? Well, bare minimum, God is a speaking God, right? God speaks, and it was. Here's a few things this morning to think about. Well, first, God is a God of words, and words matter. And God's word, which we have here from Genesis to Revelation, are the words that matter the most more than anything else. If we are are not left to our own devices to figure out big questions like this, why is there something and not nothing? Or why am I here? Or what is the plan for my life, right? All of those things are answered right here in God's word because he is a speaking God. He tells us what he wants from us, which also tells us that we should be concerned with all of that God says, every single word. Jesus says that not one little 
tiny dot of God's word as contained in the scriptures will pass away, Matthew 5 and verse 18. When I was in seminary, we, had, we asked a professor what we had to know for an exam. I was a first year in seminary. It was perhaps the hardest course, even harder uh, than Hebrew and Greek in all of your classes at seminary. And us being wide-eyed young seminarians asked the professor, well, what should we know for your exam? It was on the Gospels. His, his course was on the Gospels. And I'll never forget what he said. He looked right at us and he said, you need to know every word that came out of my mouth. Right? We sit there wide-eyed like, well, he wasn't kidding. I filled up three blue books front to back, mind you, right, with the, the hand cramps to prove it. You had to know every single word that came out of his mouth. We should say the same thing, and more importantly, right, about God's word. We should know every single word that God has spoken as contained in the scriptures. Every word. Because our God is a speaking God, and he speaks to us right here in his word. Second practical thing to pull from this has to do with what came first. Was it word or deed? It was word, wasn't it? Then God said, God speaks first and then he acts. It's word and then deed. We're not discounting word, but we know in the very creation order, God speaks first. We have a tendency, especially in our culture, to want to refrain from speaking God's truth. We know that many will get offended by it. Perhaps cancel culture will come after you, wherever you are, for speaking the truth of God's word. As they seek to cancel any dissenting voice from their current narrative. So we gravitate towards the misguided saying, perhaps you've heard, preach the gospel often and if necessary use words. That's a misguided phrase. It's an error. But we also know that rarely will anyone try and cancel you, right, or get after you for giving food to the poor. They think that's great. But when you say to them clearly, as Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Well, they will want to cancel you. They'll come after you. But word comes first, followed by deeds. It's a creation thing. God speaks, and then he does. We find it right away. We can fast forward to post-fall, post-cross, post-creation with the unfolding in the New Testament of how God's work of redemption will go forth. It goes forth in word, right? In Romans chapter 10, Paul says, How is anyone going to know the truth of the Gospels unless they're told the truth? Unless someone preaches to them the word. I'm not against building houses for the poor. Not at all. But that doesn't save them. It's the word that goes forth that does. Word and deed. Why? Well, that's what God does right here in creation. Word and then deed. Words matter. God is a God who speaks. With the ultimate revelation of the word made flesh. Jesus Christ. So we come to the first five days of creation. We see that God speaks, which brings us to point two, which is simply God orders. God speaks, and now God orders. Many of you know for many years I was an apprentice plumber, which meant I spent 40 to 50 hours, perhaps 60 hours a week, with one journeyman in particular. I was his apprentice. He was the journeyman working towards his master's license. I was working towards my journeyman's license. And one journeyman I worked for for many years, and I, he, he had all these quotes. He always was firing off these quotes, right? So one of them was this, and he would tell me this all the time. He would say, you know, organization is the key to success in any small business. And he would tell me that like every day, right? Organization is the key to success in any small business. And, you know, he said it and he did it because everything on his truck was ordered right down to the very detail, right? Everything had a place and a purpose, and if you didn't put it back there in that place, you knew about it, right? You would hear about it every time. If you took a fitting off the truck and you didn't write it down and get it at the shop the next day, you were in trouble because he ran his truck with order, he ran his jobs with order, and I'll tell you what, it paid off. He was very successful, right? He did well. Everything was done with order. Sadly, Tim 
was not a Christian at the time. I don't know where he is now. But he ran his truck with Christian principles, right? That come right from Genesis chapter 1. He ran it with order. It was organized. As we come to think about the days of creation, we see that God orders the days of creation. We can't help but see that God, in the very beginning, is filling it and ordering it with plan and purpose. I'll show you. Day one, there's light. Day four, the luminaries. Day two, sky and water separated. Day five, fish and birds. Day three, land and vegetation. Next week, day six, land animals and humans. He creates the space by speaking, and then he fills the space with life. Indeed, the whole story of redemption has order to it. Did you know that? Nothing out of plan, nothing out of purpose. As the covenant of grace unfolds over thousands and thousands of years, even through families, we read in the scriptures, we go from Adam and Eve to Noah to Abraham to Isaac to Jacob to Joseph to David to Solomon to the minor prophets, all unfolding one story of God's covenant of grace culminating in the person and work of Jesus Christ, right? That's, there's an order to it, a plan and a purpose as God is a God of order. Your very salvation has an order to it. Did you know that? You don't have to take my word for it. You can take Paul's word for it. Romans 8, 28 through 30. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose, right? And here's the purpose. Here's the plan. Here's the order. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he may be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified, right? And whom he justified, those whom he will glorify. There's an order to your salvation. Because God is a God of order. God orders creation. God orders salvation. God even orders the church. Right? He cares about the details. Paul, in dealing with the disorderly church, the church of Corinth, says this to them in 1 Corinthians 14, 33, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. Our worship is to be ordered by what the Bible says. God's word orders what we do. Because just as Paul says further in 1 Corinthians 14, let all things, this is a good Presbyterian verse, right? Let all things be done decently and in order. He's talking about what happens in the church, right? Decently and in order. Well, certainly this must apply to our lives then, shouldn't it? We are not to be a disorganized people. For God has even structured our weeks. Did you know that God has ordered your week? Six days shall you labor. Seventh is for the Lord for rest and worship. He's ordered and structured your weeks, right? Every single week, God has ordered for you. And God has told us to build our lives around that order, and therefore, at minimum, there should be some type of structure in our lives based around six days of labor, seventh for rest and worship. I know this is different for everyone, how that's ordered in between, but because God is the God of order, so too should we reflect our Creator in that way and have some type of organization in our lives. It's practical advice, but it's biblical advice. God speaks, God orders, finally God says it's good. God says it's good. There are repeated, repeated phrases in your house, there are repeated, repeated phrases in my house, especially probably if you have children, there are things that you find yourself saying over and over again, and probably because your parents said the same thing to you. I find it happening in my house uh, quite often, and I hear my mom almost speaking when I'm saying it to my kids, right? One of the things my mom used to always say to me when I didn't feel like I got what I deserved or someone got something else that I didn't get uh, amongst other things, well, she would say life's not fair, right? She would just fire that off. But then she would say tough noogies. Have you ever heard that one before? Basically, it just means too bad, right? 
deal with it. Too bad. You didn't get it. Right? She would say that to me, and it stuck with me. She would say these phrases to me. We repeat things often to get concepts across that we deem are important. We repeat things to help with memorization. And God in his word repeats things because he really wants us to know things. And we've seen repeated over and over again in the work of creation, then God said, then God said, then God said, then God said, then God said. said." Do you get the point? Right? God spoke and it was. Something else is often repeated in the days of creation too. And it's over and over and over again. Look at verse 4 with me. We'll see it together. Verse 4. And God saw the light that it was good. Skip down to verse 10. And God called the dry land earth and the gathering together of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Skip down to verse 12. And the earth brought forth grass, and the herb that yields seed according to its kind, and the tree that yields fruit, whose seed is in itself according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. That's right. Genesis, okay, skip down to verse 17. We're kind of getting the point now, I think. Verse 17. God set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth, and to rule over the day and over the night, and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good good. We find it again in verse 24 and verse 31. God sums up creation by saying this, then God saw everything that he had made and indeed it was very good. What's the moral pronouncement that the only perfect being makes over his creation? He says it's good, right? He makes a moral pronouncement, right? The only good being, the triune God, says that his creation that he has made is good. And even post-fall, after the creation itself has been subjected by Adam to the curse, it still bears the marks of goodness, though marred by sin. Which should do a few things for us, three, three practical things in thinking about the goodness of God's creation. First, it should drive us to praise. We should be praising him for his works of creation. When we look around us and we see what God has done by simply speaking, we should stand in awe and praise him. Think of most of the the Psalms, many of the Psalms, they don't start praising God for his redemption. They start praising him for his what? His creation. Read them. They praise God for what he has made. We sang one today, Psalm 136, didn't we? Praising God, His mercy lasts forever. Part of it is the creation account. Second, it should drive us to thankfulness. Why? Well, you're here, aren't you? Right? You have the breath of life in you. This whole planet has been intricately designed by God, the triune God, to sustain your life. Right? Intricately designed to sustain your life right here, right now. And even post-fall, to know that God is still mindful of us. I always think of David in Psalm 8 saying, what is, what is man that you are mindful of him, right? What is man that you are mindful of him? David says, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, there he is looking at over creation. Then he thinks about himself and he says, well, who am I that you're mindful of me? Look at all this that you have done, and yet you're mindful of me. You have made him, David says in Psalm 8, verse 6, you have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. Which brings me to the third point, practical point. We should be good stewards of the creation that God has given us. We should care about it, right? We should not abuse it, but use it in sensible ways to promote life and point back to the Creator and bring Him glory. And in so doing, always remember that God pronounced His creation as good. And He did so over and over and over again. There's one more thing that we should think of when learning about God's work of creation, at least minimum of his care and his moral pronouncement over his creation. 
It comes from the mouth of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who was there at creation taking part in it. For Jesus tells us that even his father post-fall and his love towards his creation is concerned with the birds of the air. Most insignificant little bird. Jesus says this, Matthew 6, 26. Look at the birds of the air. For they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you of not more value than they? Are you of not more value than the birds of the air? Well, the answer is yes, you are, right? Infinitely more valuable than the birds that he created. And the answer given the teaching of Scripture is, you, dear ones, most certainly are of more value because God is mindful of you. He is mindful of you. Because he looked upon you in your wretched estate and he sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, to die for your sins. And in a sense, now he can look at you, right? He can look at you. And because of Christ and his blood that covers you, right? He can say, look at you and say, you're good. Not because of who you are, right? But because of who Jesus is. And he makes a moral pronouncement over his people because of the sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ, on the cross. And he looks at you and says, you're good. He makes a moral pronouncement over his people. Not because of who I am, right? In and of myself, I'm no good. It is only through Christ, right? And his righteousness that he freely gives to all of those who repent and believe in him that he can call you good. Which should drive us back to saying, as David says, what is man that you are mindful of him? And the answer is he is mindful of you. To his name be glory this day. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for the work of creation. That you spoke. That you ordered. And that you made it good. And how it drives us and points us to how you can call anyone sinners such as we are good because you sent your son Jesus Christ demonstrating your love for us because while we were still sinners, Jesus died for us. And now because of Jesus, we can be called good. And for that, we give you praise. Father, if there's anyone here this morning who is not yet covered in the blood of Christ, may they come to him. And be pronounced good because of Christ. We ask this all now in Jesus' name. Amen.